could have to call dozens and dozens of cars without fans, but are you excited to get back in an arena with people cheering? Yeah, I don't know how it's... Yeah, I haven't really thought about it too much because it's a limited number of fans, I guess, but it's going to be nice to look around and see new faces and the anticipation on those faces, the energy, what they're going to bring. There's a big responsibility to those fans. They've got to cheer like tenfold, right? So, yeah, I'm pleased for them, right? Super pleased for them because we get to experience this. We get to be there and we've all got it in our comments and DMs how lucky we all are to be that close to these uh, these athletes. So um, I'm pleased that they're going to be able to experience that as well. The whole world situation, I mean, I haven't really crunched the numbers, but it seems like it's affected you as much as anybody, right? Because you didn't get to do shows for a long time. So I'm just curious, like, how do you stay sharp? I mean, do you do any, like, dry run calls? Or do you, I mean, what, what do you do to stay sharp when you're not getting as many reps as, as you used to, I imagine? Yeah, I've, I think I've had to deal with that quite a lot. So when I first started calling fights for the UFC, maybe, like, five events a year, and I'd gone from working, like, every sometimes twice in a weekend. I was definitely were out on the roads every two weeks. I was calling fights, big fight cards as well, as in, in number, not stature, perhaps. No disrespect to those guys. So yeah, it was, it was different, but then I'm doing a lot of stuff producing work. So I'm out in the field doing things of that nature. I think what you can do, I'm not so good at sitting myself down and trying to overdub Annick or Brendan, but what I've actually been doing is learning how to learn a bit better. I've I'm testing myself. This sounds crazy. So I've become more of a student of trying to absor uh, absorb the information a bit better. And I'm, I go about preparing my approach to fight week and how I can actively recall stuff. So I've been working a, a lot more on how I digest information. I'm writing things down a lot more rather than just copying and pasting things into a format. I'm testing myself on that. I'm making learning more difficult and it's and it really is working. So. I'm focusing on what I can do, and that's just keeping the knowledge go, right. uh, going up. But we were just talking outside. I'm not on the mats at the moment. In the UK, we can't train. So my jiu-jitsu vocabulary and MMA vocabulary from that, st that's on the slide. So there's, you do what you can. You yeah. do what you can. You've got mixed assignments while you're doing different things, right? I just wonder, I mean, you start out on, on the desk this weekend, right? But next Wednesday, you'll be on the lead. Like, is it hard to not maybe cheat a little bit and start like putting a, a little more attention on Wednesday when it's kind of your show? Versus... Oh yeah, oh I have to. I have to, I, I had a look ahead at what I've got planned. So I'm doing quick hits as well for the first and last show. I'm very excited about that. I've not done that before and it's kind of a loose format. So, so that's gonna be good fun. But at the same time I'll be on the desk so I can't be fully dressed down. Uh, we have responsibilities uh, on, on the big screen. So, yeah, I've, there's so much more with the formats and the scripts that you've got to prepare for commentary than there is for a UFC live show. But I enjoy preparing as well. Like, it, this isn't a chore. So I, I'm actually upset that I don't have more time to get into the detail of the first card, as I probably would like to if I, you know, had the freedom of a couple of weeks. Let me ask you about Kiesa Magni as a main event, obviously, you know, kind of surprise main event, but certainly two deserving competitors, Dana, you know, praise them. What do you see in, in terms of that fight, in, in terms of storylines and meaning and that sort of thing? Because it wasn't the main event that we expected, but it's still two guys that, you know, are, are pretty high profile in that division. Yeah, we go back to like 2012 and they were in, like we had uh, Kiesa that was on Tough Live and then the, the very next Tough, that was when we were introduced to Neil Magny. I mean, Mike's had a crazy journey, like all the stuff he's been through against some real veterans, some of the submission battles that he's had, all the way through to not performing at that on that big Habib uh, card, coming back as like a welterweight as well. So it, it's he's really meandered his way around. It's good to see him settle. I never know how he made uh, lightweight when you look at him now. He's a big old boy. So it's a great opportunity for him to ride some momentum. He did cancel himself out of, of 2020. I think he set his stall out early. So this is a good time for him to get back. But things that you guys might have seen was him dotting around the hotel, picking up all kinds of information from like Big Nog and DC. So he's got a real thirst for it and you could see that hunger already. And on the other side, you've got, you know, next to Cowboy, one of the most active competitors that we've ever seen. Flies under the radar perhaps because he's steady. 
got up into the top five around what was it like 2017 I think he got as high in the top five and people were looking at him as maybe challenging for that title so there's not been a great deal of peaks and troughs at, at welterweight in 2020 so these guys can really set set the standard for 2021. I agree and last thing for me I want to ask you about Maybe some, some other fights in the car. I know you do a lot of set of production work behind the scenes, research. I mean, I think a lot of us are all focused on ABC in the first fight. And, of course, everybody's talking about the main and co-main at 257. But what are some storylines on that Wednesday card? Are there, you know, are there newcomers? Are there, you know, uh, names that we need to pay attention to? Or stories that you unearth that you think fans might be interested in hearing about? Yeah. Let me get my fight card out <laughs> for you. Well, we... Well, Namagomedov, Umar Namagomedov, who we haven't seen yet, coming and making his debut against Sergei Morozov, he's got like 800,000 Instagram follows. Not many people make a debut with that kind of following. That feels like a lot of pressure, but he shares that similar mindset to a lot of the other guys in that camp. They don't put too much stock into that. But I want to see how he performs because those guys uh, have trained together. They have had the kind of most prestigious titles in Russia in, in different organizations. So now it's kind of that organization versus that organization here on Fight Island. So I think that's very interesting. Uh, Mike Davis versus Mason Jones is a fight of the highest order. Mason Jones coming over as a two-weight champion from Cage Warriors. Only Dan Hardy and Conor McGregor have done that before. He's an interesting cat. I went down to Wales, sat down with him. I think that interview's now available on UFC.com for people that want to get to know him a bit more. But very professional very handy, but Mike Davis, man, that, that guy is like former pro boxing experience who can get it done. Trains with some of the best guys in the world as well. So that one on the prelims, or those two on the prelims, that, that they are ones that you cannot miss. I was very happy to see Lezez versus Alves uh, moved on to this card as well. The Middle East is right now, I mean, we're here, so MMA and the UFC is very much in the column inches out here, but he is a phenomenal athlete. That performance that he put on Fight Island first time around made me sit up and watch. So going up against a guy who offers that submission threat, but that powerful style that we see from Wally Alves, who I think a lot of people when he first came through thinking he might be a champion one day. So, uh, so he can maybe get back in the running, but he's got a, a really tough one ahead. Yes, sir. Was that something that you, you know, obviously you were talking about it, but that you saw coming? Was there any fear that wouldn't happen? Or You never know. I did ask the question uh, to, to one of my bosses. I'm like, uh, so my contract, are we, uh, do you think we're going to be good? Do you think uh, we're going to be negotiating? And I, I, look, I got a smile back, but it was a pandemic as well. You know, who, I didn't put, too much into that, but no one really wants to be negotiating a deal in a, in a pandemic, do they? So li listen, all I can ever do is try my very best, work as hard as I possibly can, try and add value. And if the UFC like that, they'll hopefully carry on. And I think I'm in a, in a good spot, been here a while now, so just got to keep on keeping on. I'm very lucky that I, I work with some, uh, some bosses that continually challenge me in different ways. So I'm doing the producing work that I was just talking to John about, and I like doing that. The Countdown guys have actually been in contact with me as well. So in, in a few different departments, people from the UFC are seeing that I can help them out. So I'm always looking to do that. I'm not doing so much writing anymore, but then I might be doing some more of these long form sit downs, which is something I'm really passionate about. It's, it's all about storytelling. So if I can do that in as many different forms as possible, then I'm, I'm hitting my, my overall overarching goal, which is storytelling in mixed martial arts. Uh, I don't, no, I haven't really, no, I haven't really thought of it like that. It just is what it is, and I'd rather just, like, just kind of just get my head down with it. I'm only calling one fight, though. And I live a little bit closer to the Middle East, so maybe the body clock situation isn't as much of a challenge. But So I, I respect that for people that are coming in from uh, far away points. But really, I've, I don't work as much as what, those is what Brendan and, and Anik does. So 
I can prepare a little bit further out and at least get some foundations down. So I'm, I'm not feeling that pressure quite as much. How excited are you for the debut of Mason Jones? I mean, dismantled Adam Brogdon, Joe McCulgan, yeah, lost yeah, two K Warriors fights. How excited are you for him? Yeah, I'm, uh, well, having been down to Wales as well and seen how his team operates and the way that they do things, that puts you closer to the situation. So naturally, you, I can't help but be really excited for all of those guys because it's a very small part of the world and they're in a very small part of Wales. And the amount of support that they have is incredible. I mean, you look at Jack Shaw as well. They, they actually have a gym in the same town but don't train together. But I went and saw Jack at the same time. You've got guys with tattoos of Jack Shaw's on fire on their head. <laughs> this quiet little guy is garnering that kind of attention. And it's not massively different for Mason. And Mason is very good at generating a big fight feel at the same time. It feels like an occasion when he was walking out at Cage Warriors, the way he would hold that flag with pride tied into his walkout music. And like he takes risks in his fights as well. So I'm excited to see how his skills measure up at the very highest level. It doesn't really get much tougher for a debut though. Yeah, I was about to say it's kind of a baptism of fire, right? It's my biggest tough guy. Yeah, I mean, he's a guy that went out to the Tiger Muay Thai trials. I think that's when he first really came across my radar and we started seeing how good he was. And I think he actually was the first pick and, and got through. But yeah, he's... He's legit, man. He's like someone that we should be keeping an eye on for in the next year or two for breaking into the, the top echelons of that division. Are there any other names in the UK not in the UFC that fight fans should remember? Yeah, um, my teammate Sam Patterson. I've got to give him a shout out. He's he's doing really good things at the moment. He uh, he, yeah, he's he's a phenomenal athlete. Very unique, like six foot three 79 inch reach and he's 155 like he's phenomenal and the workload he puts in is crazy and i i think right now i'd probably have to say uh jake hadley he just picked up the the flyweight title at cage warriors he did the same at efc went to birmingham to see leon and jake was there as well those guys in birmingham are on a are on a, a really good flow of momentum they do things different to other cities in the uk as well they very much come together and uh he I think he'll get signed, and he's a very unique individual. He's he can sell a fight, so I think you guys would enjoy talking to him. What do you make of uh, Leon and Hamza being rebooked a third time? Well, I mean, you've got to sympathise with the matchmakers as as well through all of this, right? It's it looks like it's doomed, but let's hope that's not the case. So uh, those guys as well, that Leon needs just needs to fight. I. Coming from the UK, I can't see many other fighters that have been quite as unlucky as Leon. It is a product of circumstance, largely. And uh, I, he needs to get out there and just prove to everyone why we've missed him. And But at the same time, Hamzat Chemaev was a guy that I saw on the mats with Alexander Gustafsson years ago when he was like 2-0 and professionally, and I just knew he'd be here. He's different. Yeah. I'm not saying that he's going to walk through Leon, by the way, but... For the amount of experience that he's got, what he's showing us already, he looks like he's far ahead of that curve. So that's a great fight. John, is there anyone in the UFC commentary broadcast staple that you haven't worked yet with yet that you're looking forward to or would like to? I haven't worked with Rogan. That would be interesting. I don't think that will ever happen, but you never know your luck. Um, I haven't worked with uh, Dominic. So that could be that could be interesting as well. I think otherwise, I've I think I've worked with everyone else. I think. You mentioned uh, Omar Nurmagomedov and Sergey Morozov fight, and uh, everybody obviously expects Omar to follow the example of Khabib and fight similar uh, style. But did you did you get to? realize that he's way different? Not at all. He's nowhere near that kind of style. Yeah, he's a very much a striker. Uh, so it, it is, and I think that's great, right? Because otherwise he's just, he's just going to be carved into that groove where everyone just mm -hmm. thinks he's a version of. But there are tools that he has picked up, obviously. I think his dad uh, put him into Muay Thai, first of all, and his uncle, uh, Abdul Manap was in the in the city center, uh, sorry, the capital city, and eventually he went down there and he started picking up a lot of these wrestling looks and judo. I think was something that they added in as well. 
but yeah, he's got it, but he chooses to be quite dynamic on the feet. And uh, I, I'm, yeah, that's a, that's a heck of a fight. Great. Thanks, guys. Cheers.